very warm welcome to this edition of Europe Calling. This is the big webinar series which puts uh, together experts and decision makers on questions of European public policy with citizens. More than 70,000 people already joined our webinar series and this time uh, it's a common um, effort with Alexandra Giese, my dear colleague, who's working on digital market and digital services regulation in the European Union. And myself, Sven Giegold, I'm the spokesperson of the group of the German Greens in the European Parliament. But all this is not important today because we have so great guests, uh, Professor Suboff and Max Schrems. We also get some special guests later. So Jan Philipp Albrecht, the founding rapporteur of the uh, GDPR will join us and also the rapporteur for the Digital Markets Act in the European Parliament, Andreas Schwab, will join us to later or is already here. However, so surveillance capitalism is such an important subject. It's of course a bit ironic to organize this webinar on Zoom. I received some funny remarks about this, but it's the only tool which works as a webinar with a simultaneous translation and can digest a stunning 2,500 registrations which we had for that seminar. And it shows how important the subject is. But what this here is about is to help us to make the right legislation. The deadlines for amendments to the EU Commission's proposal is very soon. So we want to hear from you what, how to get it right, what to learn from what has happened so far in regulating the large digital giants. And um, therefore, we want to have a maximum of your uh, views and input. Uh, but then later, you are also asked to make your remarks and ask questions. And for this, use the Q&A function. Type in your questions, your remarks, shortly and briefly, sharply, and we will read them later. You can direct them to Shoshana, to Max, and by that way, uh, you can then also make it a democratic space by liking those remarks with a thumb up function, which you like most. And then we have the most relevant questions raised later. And the last point to make is, if you raise your voice or ask questions and you represent a company or a lobby, you are welcome, but please say so, so that everything is transparent. And lastly, so that more people even find to us, please tweet about uh, what you hear here, what you learn here. If things are touching you, are new for you, please share them in the social networks so that we get out of the message and also spread, for instance, uh, the, the tweets uh, which or other social media remarks which help people to join our discussion here. And lastly, uh, everything is recorded in two languages, uh, English and German. Later, it will be put on YouTube. So if you raise your voice, you will be later online too, whether you like it or not. And I wish, uh, I'm not sure whether Marx will put us for this to the European Court of Justice. He may even win, but I hope uh, this time he pardons us. And now I hand over to my dear colleague, um, Alexandra Giese. Thank you very much, uh, Sven. A very warm welcome from my side as well. Um, since this is a bilingual webinar and we also um, we're speaking from Europe on European matters, but we also want to reach a broad German audience, I will speak in German. I'm saying this, announcing this, so all the English speakers can look for interpretation, which you find uh, on your screen where the little earth is. So, jetzt mache ich auf Deutsch weiter. so I'm going to continue in German and I would like to uh, welcome everyone. I hope you're having a good evening. I'm Alexander Geser, a colleague at St. Giegold, MEP, and I am responsible for the areas, um, large areas of digital, Europe's digital policy, and I am the so-called shadow rapporteur. Uh, for the Digital Services Act. That means that for the Green uh, group, the groups of the Green in the Parliament, I am uh, responsible for tabling amendments and together with the Digital Markets Act, that's a new foundation for regulating digital services in general and especially for larger platforms. 
And that may sound a little bit abstract, but this is about the rules that will apply to Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so on in Europe. And that is the reason why we are organizing this webinar tonight, uh, because the deadline for tabling amendments to these uh, proposals, these uh, bills, um, expires on Thursday. So any ideas, any important points that we would like to table have to be tabled by Thursday. And then in September, we're going to negotiate about this. And that means that in Europe, we're at a crossroads now. So that we do have an opportunity at this point to really shape the global debate with our laws on uh, the digital realm. And we have proven in the past that we're able to do so with the GDPR. Um, the General Data Protection Act, um, which is the gold standard globally, even if it's not uh, perfectly implemented in Europe, which Max uh, Schrems is going to talk about later. So we have three draft uh, laws at the moment in Europe, which will be decisive to see, um, to decide in Europe whether we're going to stay part of the universal surveillance capitalism in Europe, or if we're going to forge our own path and um, focus on democracy, freedom, and um, a varied economic landscape and I've mentioned one of these laws, one of these draft laws for digital services. And that's about, uh, for instance, replacing the business model of uh, spy advertisements with a better one and uh, uh, protecting uh, users' privacy, protecting uh, financing for media, uh, basic laws for users so that their accounts aren't just blocked or their contributions are deleted. And then we have the Digital Markets Act uh, for fair competition between companies, because at the moment, if you have data, you're gonna win. And then the second law for regulating AI, artificial intelligence, so that uh, basic rights, fundamental rights will continue to apply in order to avoid bias when AI is used in humans. And then the third is the Data Act. That's uh, an act to create European data rooms, because the only way for us uh, to safeguard democracy, freedom, and um, Europe as an economic location is uh, to be able to really um, have our say how we're processing data in large volumes and store them here. So it's really a crossroads. Tonight is a historical moment, and um, this is going to this week is going to be the basis for how, where we're going to go. So I'm really looking forward to welcome our first speaker, uh, the major intellectual, and she has really forged and coined the the term of surveillance capitalism and given us the theory and the basis in order to even talk about what we're living in the moment because we didn't know how to talk about it because it's something completely new. Professor Shoshana Zubov has given us the, the words. She's an economist, activist, a professor, and she's written three books. And uh, I would say that she's describing, she was the first to describe this new um, uh, age and the book, uh, the Surveillance Capitalism, the Age of uh, Surveillance Capitalism has been, uh, it has been translated in a number of languages and is being compared to the capital by Marx. And she's a, um, a professor emeritus at Harvard, Ken uh, Harvard Medical School, and she's professor of human rights and she's here tonight uh, in front of all of these speakers. And I'm very honored to give you the floor, Professor Zuboff, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and thank you so much, Sven, uh, for, for convening this important discussion, for inviting me to it, for inviting my, uh, my friend, uh, Max Schrems, one of my heroes, and uh, thank you to the many of you who are, who are watching with us this evening, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you may be. Uh, I'm so happy to, to be here with all of you. You know, I like stories. <laughs> So I'm going to begin this, uh, this talk with what I think of as an iconic story about 21st century knowledge and power. The story was actually broke by Channel 4 News in London. Uh, it's about the Trump 2016 campaign's effort to deter Black American citizens from voting on Election Day in 2016. The investigative team from Channel 4 examined more than 5,000 data files that were leaked from the campaign with details on over 200 million individual American voters. 
along with all the analyses, the models, everything that was used to profile personality traits, political attitudes, behavioral dispositions, interests, concerns, vulnerabilities, and more. All of this in order to target and manipulate voter behavior, especially in the key swing states. For those of you uh, who aren't familiar with, uh, with these details of my country, the key swing states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ohio. All right, so the campaign's digital director was a, a gentleman named Brad Parscale. He gambled his modest budget all on Facebook. Facebook sent corporate staff members, embedded them with the campaign to help Pascal dominate what they call, and I'm gonna do air quotes here, the tools. The tools in this case used to identify the citizens least likely to support Trump, least likely. This audience, as Facebook calls it, was labeled deterrence. And the tools, which stand for Facebook's advertising arsenal, number one, massive scale concentrations of personal information, number two, artificial intelligence, number three, all the targeting mechanisms, uh, these were used for the purposes of targeting for deterrence. Of this audience, it turns out, 54% were people of color and 3.5 million black voters were part of this audience. So in my country, voter suppression is illegal. <laughs> and yet a senior campaign official boasted to reporters at the time of the campaign, quote, we have major voter suppression operations underway. Black citizens were bombarded with Facebook's standard range of algorithmic targeting mechanisms, subliminal cues, engineered social comparisons, psychological micro-targeting, recommendation tools, real-time rewards and punishments, gamification, and more. But now, these were specifically engineered to persuade Black citizens that the most effective expression of their political protest was to withdraw from the election process entirely. Massive scale knowledge about citizens produced massive scale behavioral change from citizens. Black voter turnout did decline by seven percentage points, the largest decline on record for Black Americans. Black voter turnout in those swing states where targeting was heaviest was a full one point lower than in the non-battleground states. All right, so what happened here? This episode suggests that citizens of the world's longest lived democracy voluntarily relinquished their some right communications freighted with inflammatory messages and disinformation tailored to individual psychological and political profiles until enough people chose to stay home on election day. Friends, this is not the totalitarian nightmare of Big Brother who breaks bodies in order to bend souls to his single truth. No, the work here is accomplished by what I have called instrumentarian power, a 21st century power, friends, secretly wrung from knowledge. It works its will through the pervasive architectures of digital instrumentation to manipulate and modify thoughts, attitudes, and behavior without the threat of terror, violence, or murder, there's no blood here, no bodies, no fingerprints, no enemy, no combat. It's seamless. In January 2020, as the world braced for an election season, 
uh, that would again test the resilience of American democracy. Uh, one uh, illustrious Facebook executive, Andrew Bosworth, uh, posted a, a blunt memo where he credited his corporation, Facebook, with Donald Trump's surprise 2016 electoral victory. So, he says, was Facebook responsible for Donald Trump getting elected? The answer is yes, but not for the reasons anyone thinks, he says. According to Bosworth, quote, Trump ran the best single digital campaign, digital ad campaign I've ever seen from any advertiser, period. The Trump campaign just used the tools we had to show the right creative to each person. Pascal, remember the Trump uh, digital czar, he confirmed this conclusion with his inimitable style. Quote, I wonder why people in politics act like this stuff is so mystical. It's the same shit we use in commercial. It just has fancier names. So how did this happen? It turns out that the economic logic that drives this transformation of secret knowledge about people into secret power over people is precisely what I have called surveillance capitalism. I call it that because it maintains four elements of traditional capitalism, private property, market exchange, growth and profit, but these cannot be realized without the technologies and social relations of surveillance. Hidden methods of observation invade personal experience and then extract behavioral data. In an extraordinary development, these data are then immediately claimed as the corporation's private property, available now for manufacture and sales. So I want to make one thing abundantly clear. The theory of surveillance capitalism challenges this property claim. It redefines it as theft. What happens after this theft occurs? Well, data travel to computational factories where they are computed into behavioral predictions. Surveillance capitalists sell the promise of certainty, a promise which requires data extraction and computation at unprecedented and therefore unprecedented scale. Another time, Facebook in 2018 describes its AI backbone, that's its factory, as ingesting trillions of data points daily in order to produce 6 million behavioral predictions each second. These predictions are sold to business customers. These predictions are the products sold to business customers in a new kind of market that trades exclusively in human futures. Just like we have other commodities futures markets, futures of oil or wheat or pork or copper. In this new surveillance economy, personal information is the stolen treasure and surveillance is the getaway car. The entire economic edifice is built on this illegitimate bed of sand. So let's talk about surveillance capitalism for a moment more. You know, it rooted and flourished during the last two decades with very little to impede it, except of course, my friend Mark Krems. It has prevailed in part because its leaders persuaded the world that their operations were somehow the inevitable expression of digital technologies and the digital future. In fact, nothing about surveillance capitalism was or is inevitable. Like every economic logic, surveillance capitalism is human made, part discovery, part accident, part trial and error, part revelation. And you know, anything that is made by humans can be unmade by humans. 
So I'm going to take a moment to describe to you just kind of a thumbnail of surveillance capitalism's origin story at a particular place and particular time, because I really want you to understand how much this creation of a 21st century nexus of knowledge and power derives from specific historical conditions and human choices. Two decades ago, when the World Wide Web was a brand new promise, and only 25% of the world's information was digitally stored, a tiny internet startup in Silicon Valley called Google had a great technology project, a great search engine, but it had not yet figured out how to make money. Then came the uh, dot-com bust. And uh, with it, uh, suddenly surveillance uh, capitalism was pulled into discovery. Google's very swanky high status investors threatened to pull out uh, because they weren't seeing the monetization that they needed. Uh, the company's founders uh, were terrified. Uh, they did not want to fail. That became their preeminent issue. And they were therefore determined to find a fast track to monetization. Interestingly, only a couple of years earlier, they had decried in, in a very well-read, well-circulated scholarly paper, they had decried advertising and they had said that it would disfigure the internet and corrupt search engines. But now in the heat of financial emergency, through trial and error, insight and chance, they discovered a way to crack the revenue problem, the secret massive scale extraction of human generated data for downstream processes of manufacturing and sales that came to be known as online targeted advertising. Instead of selling search to large internet companies and other corporate clients, which was their business plan, Google's search engine would instead become a sophisticated surveillance operation. The large caches of data left over in Google servers when its users used search and, and you know, entered into the various activities of choosing keywords and browsing, these leftover data had been called data exhaust, considered waste material. But now, unknown to users, these data were mined for predictive signals and computed into predictions of the likelihood that a particular person would click on a particular ad. And these predictions, as you know, came to be called the click-through rate. Now these were the prediction products sold to advertisers whose fortunes changed dramatically because now their success would depend upon Google's gargantuan data flows and its exclusive capabilities in advanced computation, which even then they called our AI. In 2001, around the time of this breakthrough, Google founder Larry Page found out, um, laid out his new vision in a small executive meeting. They had convened to discuss what is Google's brand. And so Page ruminated out loud, and here's what he said. If we did have a category, it would be personal information. The places you've seen, communications, sensors, they're all really cheap. Storage is cheap, cameras are cheap. People will generate enormous data. Every you've ever seen Feel the scope of its aggressive data extraction and retention practices. Anything that might, quote, stir the privacy pot and endanger our ability to gather data. Page even questioned <laughs> the legendary 
electronic scroll in the company's lobby that displays continuous he that its revenues had increased in those four years by 3,590%. This public confirmation of Google's success represented what I call the surveillance dividend. It mesmerized every investor and entrepreneur, and they all embraced the Google breakthrough. So that's what happened, surveillance capitalism thrived at Google, it migrated to Facebook, it became the default model of the tech sector, but it's important to understand that now surveillance capitalism migrates across what we think of as the normal economy, redefining nearly every sector, education, retail, finance, healthcare, insurance, every product called smart, every service called personalized, indeed, Virtually all software development now runs on the premise of maximum data extraction. By 2007, 97% of all digital information now was digitally stored, catapulting us decisively into an information civilization. And the question remained, what kind of civilization would it be? Surveillance capitalism has flourished in part because neither citizens nor lawmakers understood the consequences of an economic logic in which first, profits depend upon making all human behavior more predictable across every domain of everyday life. We're not talking about the factory floor or the office. We're talking about every aspect of our daily lives. And second, we did not understand the consequences when personal experience was redefined as the free raw material that feeds these operations. This is where inevitability actually does apply because it turns out that these economic imperatives inevitably produce anti-democratic effects, undermining self-determination at the grassroots and shaping a social structure surprisingly marked by unprecedented concentrations of knowledge and power. I say surprisingly because wasn't this intended to be the golden age, the democratization of information in the digital century? In, instead, on the strength of their surveillance capabilities, and astonishingly, in my mind, for the sake of the banality that is online targeted advertising, these empires engineered a fundamentally anti-democratic epistemic coup. Now, the word epistemic refers to everything concerned with knowledge and knowing. So what we're talking about here is a revolutionary takeover of what is known, how it is known, and who can know it. In an information civilization, principles of social order derive from the essential questions of knowledge, authority, and power that govern information. Who knows? Who decides who knows? Who decides who decides who knows? These are three questions you can slip into your back pocket and they will always provide you with a moral compass. Surveillance capitalists, it turns out now in the year 2021, they hold the answers to each of these questions, though we never elected them to govern. This is the essence of the epistemic coup. The surveillance capitalist corporations know, they claim the authority to decide who knows, they do that by asserting ownership rights over humanity's personal information. And then they defend that authority 
with absolute power to control critical information systems and infrastructures. The epistemic coup proceeds in four stages. Each stage develops the conditions for the next. I'm not going to discuss these in detail. I just want to briefly define each one for, for a very specific reason. I want you to see the big picture. Too much of our discourse is fragmented. We talk about privacy or disinformation or manipulation as if these were distinct problem sets. They are not. They are stages in a unitary process, each one building on and integrating what went before. So very, very briefly, the first stage here is the unilateral and um, of course, therefore illegitimate appropriation of what I think of as elemental epistemic rights. Epistemic rights refers to my right to be the one who knows about my own personal experience and to decide if it is shared and uh, with whom it is shared and for what purpose. And that epistemic right is the cause of which privacy is the effect. Because in deciding what is shared, I can also decide what remains private. The second stage, as you can see, builds on this. It's characterized by epistemic inequality. So what is that? It's defined by the difference between what I can know and what can be known about me, what I can do and what can be done to me. Then the third stage, epistemic chaos. This is what we've seen with the story of the Trump campaign. This is where knowledge becomes power. Unprecedented concentrations of knowledge are analyzed and modeled, producing powerful new targeting capabilities intended to influence, manipulate, and shape behavior. Algorithms are engineered to increase engagement in order to maximize extraction, which then continuously improves prediction. So here's that virtuous cycle that the surveillance capitalists have established. Unfortunately, it turns out that the human mind is drawn to the novel and the grotesque in the same way that our taste buds are drawn to sugar and fat. The result has been that this algorithmic amplification that is designed to maximize engagement in order to maximize extraction, it turns out that these algorithms are then driven to amplify the most corrupt, the most outrageous, the most extreme and inflammatory content. Now, much of it produced by coordinated schemes of disinformation. So epistemic chaos is the result. And we know it, we see it, we feel it, we live it. It's expressed in the splintering of our shared reality, the poisoning of social discourse, the paralysis of democratic politics, and sometimes even the instigation of violence and death. These conditions are fundamentally contrary to the social vision implicit in the right to freedom of speech, because that vision assumes that the best ideas naturally rise to the top in the free and fair discourse of the public square. But democracy has no defense against high velocity global communications in a private square where machine systems are engineered to unnaturally, unnaturally select corporate corrupt information, dangerous ideas in order to fulfill someone else's commercial objectives. No democracy can survive these assaults indefinitely. The fourth stage is epistemic dominance. And uh, this is where the surveillance empires now are including with democracy.
the EU experienced a consequential expression of epistemic dominance when uh, back in April of 2020, Apple and Google refused to modify their exposure notification protocol and their operating systems to accommodate European public health authorities applications designed to be epidemiologically useful for notification and tracing. Instead, these folks displace the authority of democratically elected officials and democratic governance. What I, what, what I regard as a really a terrifying display of their willingness to assert their absolute control of these critical communications infrastructures. There are many other examples. Look, we've got Facebook's audacious effort to foil democratic governance by funding and standing up its own so-called so oversight board, absent any source of social legitimacy. And we've seen epistemic dominance now again in Australia, when Google and Facebook demonstrated their willingness to face down the Australian public and government over proposed legislation for an industry code that would require companies to pay publishers for news content. Google threatened to shut down search, Facebook actually did shut down many of its pages rather than submit. And in the end, there was legislation, but the, the companies made their backroom deals and they were largely exempted from uh, the, the new industry code. So it was a loss ultimately for democracy and for the Australian people. So my friends, when it comes to the ultimate targets of this coup, let the word go out to the elected officials of our democracies, to the secretaries, the ministers, and the civil servants of every liberal democracy. In the words of the immortal John Donne, therefore do not send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee, it tolls for us. It calls for democracy. We're at a point, and I cannot stress this enough, where our issues are not with digital technologies or search or social media or any of that. Our issues are with the institution of surveillance capitalism. Surveillance capitalism is a political economic institution. It imposes a hidden institutional layer that sweeps up commercial and social action across all domains. It mediates nearly all consumption now, but also social participation, social relations, communication, knowledge production. And ultimately we see it endeavoring to insert the spaces between individuals and society and between individuals and democracy. So capitalism, in our digital century, it could have taken many forms. Why are the surveillance economics winning this race so far? Well, there are many answers, but really the biggest answer is because democracy has not yet adequately intervened to stop it. The world's liberal democracies have thus far failed to construct a coherent political vision of a digital century that advances democracy. In contrast, of course, we have the, the Chinese who have learned how to design and deploy digital technologies that advance their system of authoritarian rule, strategies that are central to their domestic and their foreign policies. It's the West's failure here, my friends, that left the void. And that void was quickly filled by surveillance capitalism. We cannot allow this to be our legacy. Ours is a young information civilization that has not yet found its footing in democracy. Our time is comparable to the early era of industrial civilization when factory owners had all the power. Their property rights were privileged above all else. The rights of workers and consumers were not even codified in law. Eventually, with decades of struggle, we did produce the rights and the laws to protect them. 
and the institutions charged with their governance and enforcement ultimately, and however imperfectly, binding industry, industrialization, the industrial economy to the principles of democracy. So my message here is not a pronouncement of doom, but a call to action. This third decade is our opportunity to lay the foundations for a democratic digital century. That's why this discussion matters, why this discussion is of historic importance. The foundations for the democratic counter-revolution are already being laid in the EU as Alexandra began to discuss in her introduction. In Europe, you are on the frontier and the world looks to Europe for leadership. I'm proud to say that in my country, in the United States, we are also seeing now significant developments that really are, are leaping ahead of where we were even a couple of years ago. And of course, there's also important work that's being done in the UK. All of these efforts contribute to the sense that we are finally at a turning point. Ultimately, of course, the liberal democracies must come together. We have to build on these developments. That means more than just a shared regulatory uh, framework. It also means a shared vision, a shared vision of and commitment to the positive and creative action uh, of institution building that will shape this civilization. So as a bridge to our discussions for the, for the rest of our time together, I wanna conclude with just a few observations on the legislative challenges and opportunities that uh, Europe is facing right now. As Alexandra mentioned, we have the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and importantly, the GDPR. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to also discussing these questions in, in more detail in our session of Q&A and, and discussion. So, um, you know, I, I just wanna underscore one more time. A century ago, the battles that we fought over industrialization were all focused on the economic domain. You know, the harms were most tangible on the factory floor. It was wages and working hours and working conditions, the, the safety of products. Today, of course, the harms are everywhere in every setting of daily life. No one is exempt, nothing is exempt. These facts make the democratic response both more urgent and most deeply legitimate. Only democracy offers the countervailing power to tame surveillance capitalism. The picture in my mind is of a, the Titanic, you know, heading for the iceberg in the dark, that enormous ship. And the very first thing that has to happen uh, before we figure out, you know, why the Titanic went off course and what happened, the very first thing that has to happen is a quick change of trajectory. We need to shift the direction of this big boat. So the very first principle that I, I want to underscore here is that the digital must live in democracy's house, not as an arsonist, as a family member, subject to and thriving on its laws and values. We will need new institutional configurations and mandates. But key to all of this is that as we approach these new legislative frameworks, they must be muscular. They must be deeply resourced. They must be invested with significant enforcement powers. Without these capacities, democracy cannot enact the countervailing power that is absolutely necessary. Without these capacities, we will be playing around at the margins unable to affect the progress of the epistemic clue, and it's a uh, clue, did I say clue? Unable to affect the progress of the epistemic clue, 
and its clear and present dangers. The audit and enforcement powers, for example, of the Digital Services Act are game-changing in this regard, but they must be invested with the full force of democratic powers. And because the harms that we've been discussing fall upon citizens, I believe that it is essential to provide citizens with avenues of redress and combat. And in the case of the GDPR, new legislative initiatives such as the DSA require a right of private action. We will need more plaintiffs and trailblazers like our Mox Schrems and his team. Mox has helped to take the GDPR from word to deed. And in this next crucial phase, we will need to open the space for that kind of citizen action across an even broader field of harms. Citizen action is what drives the life of the law and in my view will be essential. Second, we need to be strategic. We need legis legislative initiatives with distinct and complementary objectives. And we also need to understand that tomorrow we will be building on today's initiatives. So we need to conceive of a unitary strategic path. On this dimension, the EU has a formidable start. Again, the big leap forward is not the GDPR or the DSA or the DMA. The big leap forward is the combination of these three historic and powerful legislative frameworks, especially if they are resourced and oriented toward comprehensive, continuous, proactive oversight and muscular enforcement. The Digital Services Act and its audit powers break the spell that has ruled for two decades. The potential here is to draw back the curtain, collect data, analyze algorithms, and when necessary, interrupt and even outlaw systemically dangerous operations. The Digital Markets Act is the opportunity to bring these audit and investig investigatory and enforcement powers uh, now to the structural issues of monopoly and to the unaccountable power over critical infrastructure that defines epistemic dominance. The Digital Markets Act, if again, if it has these muscular powers, has the opportunity to open the competitive landscape to alternative economic models and to challenge epistemic dominance with the same kind of regulatory commitment that are brought to um, uh, critical infrastructure in other sectors, transportation, communication, energy, and other essential services. Also, it's important to mention the Digital Markets Act ex ante regulatory approach finally begins to even the playing field as regulators can anticipate and intervene before new harms make their way through society. This kind of flexible and principle-based regulatory action is essential. Now, I don't wanna suggest that these historic initiatives are the end but rather that they found a critical new beginning. So what are, what are just some of the outstanding issues that are going to need to be taken into consideration for interruption and outlaw as we move forward? Well, um, first of all, we are going to need uh, to bring our intelligence and creativity to bear on the subject of information integrity. Um, in the short run, we need to be able to institute the kinds of protocols that, uh, that suppress this uh, machine process in which the most corrupt and inflammatory content is vaulted to the center of the 
private square that is social media under surveillance capitalism. And we need to figure out protocols that can be employed in the short term that are committed to giving prominence to the information that has integrity, the information that keeps us safe and that represents what is the true social vision of freedom of speech. In other words, the best ideas rising to the center of the public square. Secondly, uh, we are going to have to, again, in the short term, uh, there are um, steps we can take. And, and both of these issues I'm bringing up have been immediate short term opportunities, but also we have to understand that they are medium term and long term challenges that we will be solving in the years to come. But the second one that I want to talk about is extraction itself, the illegitimate extraction of human generated data. I've argued that extraction is a form of theft. And uh, the real truth here is that these concentrations of human generated data are the fundamental resource that enable the epistemic coup and all that follows from it. So we have to confront extraction. Uh, in many respects, you know, we've been focusing on things like content moderation. We've been focusing on illegal content, but these really are secondary. These really are sideshows compared to the core issue of illegitimate extraction. And of course, we have to realize that to a certain extent, this extraction has not been illegal, not because it shouldn't be, but simply because we don't yet have the laws to make it so. These laws will follow the need to codify those epistemic rights that we've discussed. We need now uh, to codify in law what we once took for granted as an elemental or natural right. We need to codify in law the fact that I am the one uh, who has the right to know my personal experience and decide if and how it is shared. And the truth is that these elemental rights have never come under systemic threat before any more than we have laws you know, to protect our rights to stand up or, or sit down or yawn. But now the surveillance capitalists have declared their right to know our lives. And under these unprecedented conditions, the ones taken for granted right to know and to decide who knows about me must be codified in law if it is to exist at all. And finally, you know, when we talk about extraction, we're talking about the supply side of the epistemic coup. I also want to briefly mention the demand side. These are the human futures markets that produce the financial incentives that drive massive scale extraction. And so, of course, we have an opportunity now. We understand that these human futures markets that began with online targeted advertising inevitably, inevitably produce anti-democratic consequences at the level of grassroots and its superstructure. And we have the opportunity to finally say these kinds of markets produce systemic threats and they should be outlawed. I'm not only referring here to the uh, advertising markets that we now call surveillance advertising, but I'm also referring to countless other uh, forms of these new prediction markets, whether they're in the insurance industry, the education industry, the uh, real estate industry, these are, are now uh, threaded throughout our economy. So there are many um, aspects, uh, many um, instances of these markets that uh, will want to take aim. And the fact is that Outlawing markets that trade in human futures is not behind our, not beyond our grasp. We have uh, outlawed markets that trade in human organs, that trade in human beings, because they are inevitably dangerous, a threat to people and democracy. And we can do the same here. So to conclude, 
it turns out that we may have democracy or we may have surveillance society, but we cannot have both. A democratic surveillance society is an existential and political impossibility. For the sake of a democratic digital century, the regulatory baton must pass from economists to the warriors for democracy. Lawmakers and citizens will be the protagonists of this decade as they rise to the protection and advancement of humanity's best idea. We have a democratic information civilization to build, my friends, and there really is no time to waste. Thank you. Wow, Shoshana, that was strong. And what a pleasure in this world dominated by clicks to listen to 45 minutes powerful speech and intelligent design uh, of logical arguments uh, full of uh, morality and as you promised stories. Uh, you triggered a lot of uh, discussion and uh, I would uh, like uh, to share first uh, two um, questions with you and one is in German so get yourself prepared for this funny uh, language. Uh, I would also uh, like to say one thing. It was also typical transatlantic speech because what is progressive transatlantic speech? It means Europeans looking to America for hope and support and Americans looking to Europe for hope and support. In the end, uh, we can only do it together. We will not be rescued by each other. And that is, I think, in particular true when it comes to that subject. So I would like to share the thoughts of Peter Koenig with you. Koenig means, by the way, king in German. So, müssen wir die digitalen Monopolien... Do we have to uh, take up the digital monopoly right uh, of the platforms, the patent rights, the secrecy rights of the uh, source code? Uh, don't we have to reform them, to make them shorter, to limit them in order to uh, give uh, the power of knowledge back to the sovereign citizen and in order to make a competition possible in IT and uh, to make uh, out of it uh, the decisive element of the market? words and even longer sentences. Shoshana, I hope you could understand it or shall I repeat it in English? Um, yes, if you if you could, Sven, if you could just repeat the gist of the of the uh, question. Okay, I'll read it that very quickly in, in English. It's easier then. Uh, do we have to reform or shorten or limit uh, digital monopoly rights of digital platforms, such as um, the rights <coughs> of the um, uh, or, um, or patent rights, uh, secrecy rights of the source codes, and uh, uh, also the connections, uh, in order to re to give back the power of knowledge to the sovereign citizens, uh, and um, make a competition again to the dominating market principle also in IT. Was this bad translation better to understand? Well, let, let me answer let me answer this way. Um, monopoly power is one part of the problem, but it's not the entire problem. Historically, you know, the, the great example was uh, in, the, in the United States in the late 19th century, uh, the birth of antitrust law. And then finally, um, around 1917, when our Supreme Court uh, finally decided on the legality of breaking up what had been the, the largest and most pernicious monopoly, Standard Oil. So Standard Oil was broken up 
but it was broken up into 36 companies. And those companies were each fossil fuel companies in their own right. And very quickly, those companies began to re-aggregate. Uh, and uh, pretty soon we had ExxonMobil you know, emerging from this, uh, from this antitrust breakup. So what is the point? The point is if we take, for example, a Facebook or a Google and we simply break it up, we simply turn it into smaller units, but those smaller units are continuing to operate according to the uh, economic imperatives of surveillance capitalism, then we have not achieved our goal. So we have to pay attention to both of these. In, in breaking up companies and limiting monopoly power, we can do something very important, and that is we open up the competitive landscape. Because of course, we, you know, I've, I've talked about democracy having the, the countervailing power here, but we also have to recognize that we are going to get uh, important help in this transformation process from the market itself. Surveillance capitalism in a, in a very real way is a profound rupture of an ancient economic law called supply and demand. Uh, people do not want surveillance capitalism, and yet it's the only thing that there is on supply. So this kind of breaks down that whole principle. And there are, you know, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs of companies that want to come on stream and attract, attract investment, but they don't want to be doing surveillance capitalism. And so by breaking down monopoly power, we give this, uh, you know, creativity of the market, a chance to blossom again, uh, and a chance to reconnect supply and demand, answer individuals' real needs and answer society's real needs. Um, so I wanna stress the Digital Markets Act with its structural orientation and the Digital Services Act uh, with its orientation more to the internal operations you know, and how we audit and oversee and hold these internal operations to standards of fundamental rights uh, and to standards of public service and public law, uh, then these two things in combination with, of course, a GDPR uh, as, as part of this uh, landscape, as part of this canvas, uh, this is where I think uh, the strength derives from. Thank you. And uh, I have one more question before we then uh, go to the next step. So, and this is by uh, Tendai Tagarira. Sorry for my bad pronunciation. Uh, and this is one is in English. In the race to artificial intelligence domination, data sets play a fundamental role as artificial intelligence is only as good as the data set. How will Europe remain competitive against China if data harvesting, data processing, and data manipulation is hindered by legislation? Will Europe not risk becoming a second-rate player in the race to artificial intelligence? And then uh, she follows with some praise for your book. And I can only join into this. So this is the German edition. I hope you have a copy, uh, Shoshana. Uh, I do, anyway, course. you can get it. Uh, you can get it yourself uh, very easily. Ah, <laughs> but now the serious question. All right. Well, um, look. What we're what we're dealing with now, I mean, when we talk about epistemic <clears throat> chaos, we're dealing with the uh, wholesale corruption. Of, of information flows. And so um, part of the, the challenge now, if we want to have a society that can function as a, uh, with common sense, a society that can, that can um, function with the kind of a democratic discourse that is necessary, especially when we disagree, um, 
we are not being served now for these fundamental societal requirements. We are not being served now because the, the worst information, the most corrupt information, the most toxic information is being thrust forward uh, when the, uh, the common sense information, the information with integrity uh, is being shunted to the sidelines. In a normal functioning society, it's just the opposite. Uh, there's always some crazy stuff, but it emerges at the fringes and it stays at the fringes. Uh, and the trust is, the trust in the democratic system is, the trust in the freedom of speech, the right to that freedom, the trust is, the faith is, uh, that in an open, free and fair uh, public square, uh, the, the, it's the good ideas that are thrust into the center. It's the good ideas uh, that most of us get to participate in and learn about and communicate about. So uh, the exact opposite is happening uh, to us now. This is weakening our institutions. It's weakening our society and it's driving us apart. So I see no value uh, in trying to keep this system intact because actually it's the source of danger. Um, whoever, the, the person who asked this question also kind of brought up a, a kind of national security dimension that I think is worth mentioning. You know, um, there was a time uh, with the war on terror, uh, the tragic events of 9-11 of um, where the whole governmental shift occurred in the United States. It, before 9-11, if you were on Capitol Hill talking about the internet, most likely, most likely you were talking about privacy legislation. After 9-11, most likely you were talking about total information awareness. And what happened was these fledgling internet companies, which that with their new surveillance capabilities, uh, probably would have come under uh, uh, the you know, suppression from uh, federal privacy legislation had it not been for how 9-11 changed the priorities, changed the emphasis, uh, changed the sense of, of need within the government. But what I want to call to this, um, this um, discussion's attention is that you know, right now there are some very different um, views that are that are being developed in the national security domain because now the fact that our lives have been made so transparent the wholesale destruction of privacy that has taken place primarily as a result of surveillance capitalism um, what this has done is what in the in the information warfare discourse this has increased our attack surface. It's increased our attack surface as individuals, and it's increased our attack surface as societies. And this now has become uh, a grave concern among many in the, uh, in the national security field. When I told you the story of the Trump campaign, that is a perfect explanation, a perfect illustration of how this, uh, this uh, paroxysm of, uh, of, of uh, human generated data now made available through Facebook, on Facebook, uh, anybody with, with the uh, right advertising budget, the right know-how, uh, any oligarch, uh, anyone who's determined to do so can get access to these huge concentrations of information as we saw in my story about particular groups, particular people, particular audiences, and they can wreak havoc. Uh, so we are now more vulnerable than we have ever been. More vulnerable to foreign manipulation, to oligarchic manipulation, to political manipulation, to the manipulation simply that comes through these commercial channels. Of, of advertisers and, and other uh, co commercial customers. So um, I don't think that, um, that we're at risk of uh, weakening ourselves in, with respect to China. 
On the contrary, I do think that if the Cold War has taught us anything, it is that uh, a strong democracy uh, is uh, a magnet for just about everyone in the world. And the strong democracy, strong democratic institutions, uh, good information with integrity uh, that we can learn by, that we can come together with, that we can do science with, uh, these are the things that will, that will make us strong. And these are the things that will allow us to compete against, for example, China uh, or any other uh, competitor. Thank you. And uh, I also, and that is a long held view, uh, in particular of the German Greens, that we will succeed in global competition on the basis of our values and by credibility in our values and not by selling them on a global marketplace. Well, uh, thank you. So now let's listen to another hero, first hero today, now second hero, Max Schrems. Uh, Max, uh, we were placing great hopes, and we just heard it again from America in the GDPR. So, uh, and uh, you are you were already uh, uh, in the courts before the GDPR, and you continue to use uh, law enforcement. You even have set up your own organization with a beautiful logo, and um, and now. We would like to hear on the view out of surveillance capitalism. Where are we in Europe in the legal framework? And what, what is the reason that uh, GDPR has not helped us out of surveillance capitalism? What is your balance sheet? Uh, and, uh, and what's uh, your recommendations for the next steps? Max, the floor is yours. And you are, of course, not only a hero, but a lawyer. And that is both to be combined. It's very rare, uh, but it exists. Max, you have the floor. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I was asked to speak in German um, as apparently around 90% of the listeners are um, German speaking. So I'm just quickly gonna switch. Um, as you all know by now, there's this interpretation button on the bottom of Zoom if you need to switch to German. Ähm, ja, danke auf jeden Fall. Ich wollte mal. Oh, thank äh, you very much. So, I'm just thinking, what could I even add to what Shoshana said? Said because uh, she really uh, mentioned so many relevant points already. Maybe it would be interesting to think about how to really uh, specify individual point uh, down from the theoretical. We have a few um, legal rules that we can talk and we um, are busy with uh, actually implementing these laws. So we're making sure that the theory gets to your mobile phone. And uh, some things in the GDPR are not working, and that's something that I also would like to mention in my uh, speech. And so we're still at the very beginning of all of these um, debates. I think that has become clear. We're really at the very start of the digital transformation. I mean, um, workers' rights, employees' rights uh, have been a topic for a hundred years, and it took a few decades for them to be enshrined in law, and I think it's going to be the same in this uh, topic. So let's start with the inevitability with that point, that this way uh, that things are working now in the digital realm is God-given and inevitable. And I think that's a very interesting narrative, and it's completely block that the industry keeps um, repeating it. It's what they really stand on. And they're always saying, well, when data protection really comes, um, and if the ECJ uh, will re really decides this way, the internet will break. It's not going to work anymore. So that this uh, situation is inevitable is really a dominant view. And it's very interesting. We often see it when we're at court and uh, talk with authorities, even data protection authorities can't even imagine. They don't think that uh, this would be possible in conformity. And uh, that means 
that uh, we have some nice things in law enshrined, but that doesn't mean that is going to be put into practice really for citizens. So um, one uh, point to start with, I really thought it was an interesting point to say, who has the right to this uh, data? There's some theories, a the classical theories of a proprietor's law is that you gain um, proprietorship of something then uh, through work. So if you're working on something, it should be yours. That's a classic uh, theory, but uh, that's only true if it didn't belong to anyone in the first place. And, uh, you know, personal data, well, you know, the common theory is that it belongs to the user. They belong to the user. So if you then take them, that's theft. So if you're coming from this uh, classical uh, theory, that's a debate that we often have, that we often have. And um, the idea of uh, surveillance capitalism in uh, Europe is something that we have a little bit of a different access to, so that the right to personal data and data protection is a basic law, uh, um, an alienable law, similar to the law uh, to physical um, intactness and uh, to be protected from physical harm to uh, vote, the right to vote. So it's not a capitalist right. It's not a financial right, the right to own ownership of your own data and data protection. And so I think that in the terms of the in terms of the theory behind it is a little bit different from the US. It's similar uh, with copyright law. There are uh, non-commercial copyright laws in Europe, which uh, also exist in, in the US, but are not as dominant, not as politically relevant, I think. So in Europe, we have that opportunity to start from a little bit of different mindset. So the society is maybe in their mindset a little bit closer to non-surveillance capitalism, so we don't have to overcome as many hurdles to get there. And I think it's always interesting to, to look at what parts have to be decommercialized. De so for instance, parts of my body are not for sale. I can't sell them. But even that isn't completely true because I can sell my hair, for instance, if I cut it off. So there's always the question, how far can you go? You cannot sell your right to vote, but you can sell your right uh, to free uh, speech um, if you sign an NDA. So I think that's an interesting um, topic, but I think in Europe, we, could, we start from a less commercial mindset. And my the major problem that I see in practice often is that this dogmatic um, uh, approach, this principle approach, this mindset isn't something that you see at all in industry. Industry is really far away from society and um, poli the policy. And we've seen that in the GDPR. I mean, uh, it was clear as a law and five years after it's been adopted and centered into fourth, there's a lot of ignorance in the industry. Even if you talk to industry uh, lawyers, to their legal department, they're not even convinced that there's any legitimacy to these laws, that they should exist, they're really not convinced of that, they don't believe it. So it's it, you have to convince them that this is a real law, that you're infringing against that law, you that you're infringing against a fundamental right. And so we have this bubble uh, of industry in Europe with their legal uh, departments and lawyers they have a lot of funding and use that to support, to undermine the political consensus that we have. We see that in their PR, we see that in court. Every time a journalist says, well, if you want to have something for free, then you have to give up your data. Isn't that fair, this exchange? So in theory, we have a good law for data protection, but in reality, it doesn't really quite carry all the way because it's being ignored oftentimes. So we had this major project to cookie banners on cookie banners. I mean, everyone hates them and only 3% of people would actually consent to the cookie banner. So um, it's me giving up my fundamental law. I mean, I can do that. I can also uh, give up my fundamental law to be alive by jumping off a bridge. That's part of our society. But in this case, interesting is that only 3% would like to give this up and uh, really um, consent to online tracking, complete online tracking. But the cookie banners are designed the way that we know them and uh, over 90% have to give up their fundamental law. So it's quite interesting. So a third of the people maybe don't want to vote, but I can 
trick 90% into not voting, as you um, said with your story about voter deterrence. So that really is quite the problem. And I think the, the scale of the problem is exceptional in data protection. There are a few uh, other areas where large companies publicly infringe so um, majorly against the law and then just call it innovative. Um, that's quite unique to data protection. And that's the reason why I went into data protection. After three years of the GBPR, what we're seeing is that we more and more see statements, well, if you want to really enforce the GDPR, that's quite an extreme position. I mean, to really want to apply your fundamental law uh, and use it, that's quite extreme, they say. So that's a uh, really what you can see from that those positions you can tell that they haven't understood they haven't changed their mindset and it's interesting because these uh, infringements of fundamental laws are then um, belittled so for instance in advertisement so years of my online clicking every page that i've ever visited uh being recorded by google by facebook etc and that is really ext an extreme measure of surveillance. And we've talked about uh, um, metadata, long-term storage of data. I mean, this is about every page I look at. This is not for terrorism prevention, as it was uh, in the case of the data retention, but just to improve their click-through rate. I mean, it's really shooting birds with cannons. and. The, we still have this opinion that this is a legitimate process. And uh, for instance, um, the pri when private companies in Germany say that they have the right to store financial data for 80,000 people, even people who have never uh, paid for any of their services because they have access to the financial data um, of the financial surveillance authority in, in uh, Germany, just because maybe in the future they have a customer and he won't be able to pay. So that's the theory is really far from the practice. Lots of uh, major parts of the GPR are being ignored. And sometimes you still have to continue to to have this major discussion, but that should be over because we have a law ever since 2018. And my last point on that, I think that's quite um, telling and uh, it's already been said tonight anyways, democratic and uh, um, the mindset, democratic mindset that many customers, uh, companies have. So we're going to do whatever we want. There are some rules, but we'll just uh, find a way to um, do what we want anyway and to get away with it. So a, a different um, attitude to the rule of law and uh, under data protection law, the facto these things are just not enforced. And I think that's what we have to focus on in Europe. It's not right that we adopt laws at the European level because the EU is largely uh, a legislative body, not an executive body, and the member states then uh, don't do their executive job. And then we're ridiculed globally for that, thinking the GDPR was something that was announced, announced broadly and uh, many in many parts of the world it was said that well in reality you're not going to have to actually and for um, stick to that you're not going to have to comply with it and that is a problem also in, uh, in the image for europe and i think that the hope is that europe can be a pioneer often on paper that's confirmed so in terms of our diplomatic system considering that we have 27 member states with very different structures europe is quite progressive on paper and able to adopt far-reaching changes. But the enforcement of those changes is a major problem. I mean, um, the Irish Data Protection Agency is one of my favorite topics. They had over 10,000 complaints last year and haven't taken a single decision on any of them. So I have this right to data protection, but 10,000 people complaining, zero have gotten a decision. And um, well, that's similar to me saying you have the right to vote, but we don't have anywhere for you to go and vote to for 100 percent of people so it's a theoretical right uh that's the access to the world that north korea has i think we have to be more honest in europe and learn from the past so now when we're looking at new laws in europe at the european level i think the gdpr can be a lesson that we can learn from like a, a warning that should be heeded when the new laws are adopted 
So a couple of things that were a problem, an issue, was that the um, industry lobbied for some things and then they weren't uh, put clearly in the law. So when you're at court, you can you can only look at the letter of the law and it's quite contradictory or it's not very clear and then the courts doesn't know how to decide so that's the result of lobbyism so they just say well keep it vague so that it's not clear and then we don't have to uh, comply to it and uh, that is a, an issue for small and medium companies and um, they don't have they want clear laws. This is actually to their disadvantage because they can't afford to go to court and say that this is so vague, I don't have to climb it. So they have major problems with the GDPR with the way it's been written because it's not very clear. And so it's uh, the situation where some authorities that say, well, it's not very clear, the legal situation is not um, simple, we don't understand. So often for authorities, it's not interesting. It's not something that interests them to actually take action and uh, try to find reasons why they uh, stay inactive. There's a case in Luxembourg, the competent authority says, we're really sorry, but we can only act within a Luxembourg and check things within Luxembourg and the internet goes beyond Luxembourg. So we're not even even able to enforce all of this. So, so if you don't set things out very clearly in the law and define everything with every part, every full stop and every comma in place, then it, it's not enforceable. And in Silicon Valley, we have an entire industry where they try to blow up every question and just um, act as if that wasn't a, a rule, a provision. And um, this narrative that Silicon Valley has helped to build, I think that was also an idea of Facebook, move fast and break things. And what's been broken is often the law, just by massively on all levels, break, infringe against the law, but you can somehow you know, get away with it because the authorities can't even keep up. So if authorities aren't strengthened in their enforcement, I mean, every time I say that, it, it pains me to say it because I like minimal invasive authorities and I'm really quite a liberal person. But if we don't have that, these companies with their major force, their juggernaut um, character are really not going to be something that we can tame. So I think there's a lesson to learn from the GDPR what worked and what didn't work. And um, for the next uh, laws that are coming now, we can uh, try to make sure that they work better. And uh, I think that we also have to force member states to be more proactive because some member states have made it a business model, their business model to ignore European law. And I think that we need a more European approach to that. I think, I hope that's going, that's going to be a little bit helpful in order to see how these theory work on the street in practice. I'm really looking forward to some questions and feedback and a discussion now. Thank you very much, Max. That was very interesting. We have lots and lots of questions. I'm going to um, ask you a few when we come to the public part of the debate. We're going to read a few uh, questions. And thanks again for uh, really focusing on enforcement. That's our problem. That has been the issue with the GDPR from the very beginning. If we'd enforced it fully from the beginning, we wouldn't be where we are now. And my team and half the group of the Greens uh, now rewriting the enforcement chapter of the DSA to make it stronger with strong authorities that can face up against these companies. So uh, some questions from the audience. I would like to start with one uh, that says that the principles of consent in uh, processing a data under the GDPR, I mean, that's something that's really dear to our hearts that users can decide themselves. And they, uh, the question says, this is part of the problem, not the solution. So behavioral data and data analysis by big data, shouldn't that be illegal in principle so that we can decide ourselves? Well, two hearts uh, beating in my chest here. So in principle, I'm really quite liberal as to how the, the rules should be set. I, can't, I should have the right to say that I don't want to vote and that I want to jump off a bridge. That is something that we should have in a liberal uh, state with the rule of law. So I can give up my right to property by giving something away, my ownership of something. So 
I don't think you should tell people targeted advertisement is evil, because if you want it, feel free to have it. It's just the way that how it happens, that should be real. Very few people would actually want to jump off a bridge, and very few people want everything uh, be, to be under surveillance, if you really ask them. So that's the level where we have to start. And the basic issue is that a consent is really quite the exception. So in principle, under the GDPR, I have six um, legal bases, only one of them is consent, and in five other scenarios, I can process data without much uh, discussion with legal obligations, contractual obligations, etc. And so for um, lots of things, you have this um, exception. So, I mean, uh, in most of the cases where I say oh, I'm okay with data processing, I'm, uh, the companies are already covered. So historically, this has grown in a different way because of the California Business Act, there's a notice and choice principle, um, and on that basis, Silicon Valley has been working. So notice and choice is part of the consent now, and uh, the consent is being used in the following way. It's just uh, shifting the responsibility from the company to the user, saying it's your fault that you consented. But, but you never had another choice as a user. And this shifting of the responsibility to the user is something that if consent, the principle of consent was really um, enforced, and if the GDPR was used correctly, it shouldn't be possible. And we looked at the cookie banner on 10,000 pages, and we can see that uh, only 10% of the sites um, don't manipulate their users in the way that they handle this. And I think that's where authorities have to be um, proactive. I don't think we should exclude consent completely. And I mean, maybe there are some areas where it should be excluded. So for instance, I cannot sell my liver. They shouldn't be able to do it. But I can agree that my kidneys are being are going to be donated. So I think these principles should also apply to data protection. Thank you very much. And a reminder, uh, we have the new operating system of, um, from Apple, where you have to opt in. So you have to um, decide uh, whether you want to be uh, tracked by Facebook, and 96% of American users have rejected it. So it's true, if you give uh, users a real choice, then they will mostly reject uh, that. So um, a technical question now. But uh, you can go beyond that if you want. And your answer, it's a question on browsers. Would it be possible to uh, make sure that browser um, producers have to implement a function where you can just click on something one time and then only data that are necessary for a web service will be collected forever? So, I mean, in, in theory, you have that, the do not track services, but it doesn't really work. It's not really working. Yeah, I think that's another thing that didn't really work. There's an opt out uh, in the GDPR, but it hasn't been implemented. And we had all these uh, debates that nobody told us what standard is the right one. And um, this entire debate uh, is something that belongs to the e-privacy debate. And two weeks ago, I don't know if uh, that's uh, the, what the question is about. We uh, have adopted a new uh, prototype together with uh, Vienna University. It's, uh, um, advanced, it's called Advanced Data Protection Control, so it's a specific consent. Uh, do not track is only an opt-out. And uh, that's not what we want under uh, European, the European principles. We want an opt-in. And opt-in, there's, no, there's not been a signal how uh, to do that technically, but it's quite simple technically. But the industry, of course, says it's really too difficult. We can't do it. So now, as an NGO, we've published that, we've built that as an NGO just to show that it's possible. And the interesting question now is um, whether that's going to be implemented in e privacy. And I don't know whether that would be the right place for this uh, problem and that I do my own consent management via the browser. So ATPC explains how that could work. Uh, that might not be the, the best standard, but it's like 90% of the best standard, just to show that it's possible, that it's feasible. But that's a, a question for the legislative, where they have to say, this is the mechanism, this is the standard that every website has to have in Europe. 
And as long as we don't have that, the websites will keep yeah, we'll keep saying know. what's the right standard. Yeah, we see implementation and the concrete things are what matters. I have a personal question, uh, which was also uh, mentioned in the questions here. Why is there often so much distrust when it comes to saying, well, we implement a public solution, a public platform, um, public digital identities and so on. Uh, people are very skeptical towards such an idea from the community, from the data protection community. Uh, while uh, as to private companies, there seems to be less skepticism or uh, people find ways uh, to find a way out uh, just for them personally. Uh, but this means that the society is still uh, registered uh, and does not uh, has a solution. It has been said uh, that we don't have a choice, that in the end uh, uh, we depend on these services. And there was a question by somebody uh, who um, is a representative of uh, uh, the disability um, association of uh, deaf people. So this right uh, to accessibility, how can it be uh, reconciled with uh, data protection. So um, public initiatives, could they be a way out? Uh, how could we establish them? And another question, how could we achieve that European open source solutions, which do not track, uh, could have a chance in this economic environment? Well, I think these are two questions. The first question, public. Uh, at the Corona tracking app, uh, uh, people got uh, extremely annoyed. Uh, they thought they were forced to it, even if it was the most uh, data protection friendly app we have ever seen. Uh, but when it's public, when it's the state, uh, the government, um, well, this means something for the people, even though all the Android and uh, Apple operating systems uh, probably include uh, more tracking systems than uh, the public apps. But often people don't understand these things publicly. And a lot of this uh, discussion uh, is uh, done at an emotional level. Uh, people uh, are afraid of certain things. Uh, and uh, people left our association when we said the app is not such a big problem. Uh, people said, well, if you are not against this app, I leave your association. Uh, so this is indeed a problem. And I don't think that the state is always the best solution for something like this, because a state normally has its interest, is very slow, and uh, the open source uh, um, topic is probably the, be the better way. I think dogmatically, Europe has a good approach, uh, which also exists in the United States. A lot of what we have uh, as an antitrust uh, legislation already exists in the US. Maybe it's more lively here. And if you think that we have open telephone uh, networks, open electricity networks, open train networks, uh, that uh, today uh, I have uh, 50 different internet providers I can use via my telephone line. This is something that re Americans often uh, uh, do not understand. They have just one provider which costs a hundred dollars and is not very reliable. We have this open network ID, uh, which is something based in the EU, not so much in the national member states. It was forced upon the national member states uh, that they split up their national monopolies. And the splitting up of monopolies is something which is very prevalent in European law. And I think it's also very interesting for digitalization because we used to have a uh, uh, completely open network uh, in the internet. I uh, can send a mail uh, from one server to another one. You don't to be a member of a central mail service. Uh, but now we have superstructure um, and uh, people uh, or these companies attend, uh, attempt to control this all. So strategically, it would be important that we say in certain areas, we have a legal obligation of an open interface. Not all the data have to be open, but the interface must be open. And with this, we could um, um, we, we could dynamize again this market, uh, which has come to a stop. And uh, as fa Facebook, you have the same shit. Uh, you have been have had the same problem for the last ten years. No innovation, uh, but if you have um, a network which is interesting uh, for people who are blind or uh, deaf, 
um, with text, with descriptions, well, this is something that can be done with an open interface. Uh, if I have the possibility to allow such other uh, initiatives. And Europe is in a good position here because uh, it's often said uh, in the US industry that things are bad, bad because they kill off uh, the American companies. Uh, we can say, well, if you're as invented in, in uh, as dynamic as you always say, you will find a solution also for what we impose on you. And smaller companies or products would thus become a possibility to participate in the market. Since I've been dealing with Facebook, I got about 500 emails um, on better networks, but they all um, have a problem with the network effects. That's why they cannot uh, thrive. So uh, I think in Europe, uh, we have a chance because we have been able to do this in other fields. So why not in the internet? Why not in the field of digitalization if we manage uh, to impose this thing for uh, gas uh, provision and electricity provision? Thank you very much. So data protection and uh, the, the internet and the uh, fundamental rights are very complementary because these are the two issues here we're talking about today. And now I'm handing over the uh, floor uh, to Sven Giegold for the general debate. Now let's continue our show of heroes. Uh, and the next one uh, is, uh, of course, Jan Philipp Albrecht. Jan Philipp, perhaps you can switch on your uh, camera. And, uh, and uh, I also welcome Andreas Schwab, who is now with us, who is still having the chance to become a hero. So also, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, that is really a cool meeting here. So Jan, uh, could you tell us, how do you see things? So uh, you are now Minister for Digital and Draußen, uh, as you say, you can explain that later, uh, for the a uh, great state of Schleswig-Holstein, which is a uh, superpower in the north of Germany. And uh, beyond, but uh, what is your, what do you make of it? So we had all celebrated uh, the uh, GDPR rules. Uh, you received uh, great applause by Shoshana. And what do you make of it? Were your hopes realized and where yes and where no? Uh, I know it's a hard question, it's a big one, but perhaps you can keep mainly in mind what you will tell us, what you will tell Andreas and us what to put now in the next stage uh, of European rules in the area. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. And the first big question is if I should talk in English or German. <laughs> Okay, I decide. So English. Um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, reflect a bit on what has been said. Um, maybe not by repeating things, but by saying some different views. Um, I'm, I'm not completely sure if um, the lack of enforcement um, can be fixed inside uh, the legal framework uh, which we are having. Um, we tried to fix that during the process of passing the general data protection regulation um, in a way which um, built up uh, a legal framework for cooperation of data protection authorities. And I think that this is uh, one of the major keys to um, succeed in a uh, supranational framework and in an international market. Um, we need to have a strong legal framework for cooperation of enforcement agencies, uh, which makes sure that if one is not doing his or her job properly, another one can force him to do so. The framework is in place. It's part of the general data protection regulation. You can force um, a data protection authority in one of the member states to do um, what the majority of data protection authorities in Europe wants. The problem with, with it is first, uh, therefore you need to have data protection authorities which are well equipped to have people to work out the basis for such a legal decision um, uh, and to have insight into cases which are mainly dealt with by another authority and they are into the case norm normally. And secondly, you need to have um, 
the willingness of not only the authorities, but also their employers, the governments or parliaments, to sue other member states' authorities, which is very uncommon inside the European Union. It's even very uncommon that member states are suing each other on infringing the treaties which they signed for the European Union. We see that at the moment when it comes to rule of law in Poland or in Hungary. Uh, where it is a surprise in the end that after years of debate, the European Commission is starting infringement procedures. Um, normally, only the European Commission is, is doing that at all. And in this case, the Data Protection Authority of the European Union doesn't really have to say anything in the cooperation mechanism and doesn't really have the, the power to go uh, on the issues which are not uh, directly linked with the EU institutions themselves. So that is the main problem and can only be solved in the member states of the European Union and in the data protection authorities of all the member states. So what I would like to add is that in the end, I don't think that like fixing the legal framework is in the end fixing the problem because this legal framework has been built up over decades. We have had uh, directives in the European Union which were strong already. We had national laws which were strong. And we have that also in many other areas. We have fundamental rights, uh, not only in the member states, but also in the EU Charta of Fundamental Rights, which is now by the ECJ declared directly applicable in many cases. So um, it's all in place the legal framework. We can make it more specific. We can make it therefore better for Max and others to go in front of court, uh, courts to, to ask for things to be enforced. But what we can't fix with it is the incapability of agencies and enforcement uh, authorities to do their work. And I say that as a responsible minister for a, a German land, which of course has to uh, deliver for that. And um, and that's not, not so easy because you have to have uh, the awareness in governments that data protection and other digital rights um, are not nice to have and that surveillance of market players in this regard are not a nice to have, uh, but uh, an important cornerstone of our digitized future and of a functioning market and of a fundamental right um, a framework, which is looking into a completely digitized and therefore globalized uh, world. And um, I hope that we can build up that uh, awareness and I hope that we can uh, also build up strong agencies, maybe in some areas like with the digital markets or, or digital um, uh, service act, it makes sense to go on with debates of, for example, a strong European agency um, so that you can have a more central and um, competent agency doing work directly rather than going through the member states. But I also have to say, um, if you concentrate only on that, you might lose everything in the end because member states still have a lot of power in the European Union. Thanks. Thank you. And now uh, uh, I would uh, also in order to bring everybody in, because Andreas Schwab is now the man to talk to. Andreas, please join us here if you, you had already switched on your air. Yeah. Hi, Andreas. So this is also Europe. I would like to say that in Germany, uh, in three months, we have uh, federal elections in Berlin. Uh, we wouldn't have a seminar like this, that someone who comes from the EPP joins a green seminar and is treated well, and you will be treated well, and, uh, and we don't make this now an election show, and that is also European Parliament. I would like to say that, and thank you that you were coming, but you could listen to a lot of uh, interesting uh, speakers and views, and what do you make of it? Uh, so what is your ambition? You are the rapporteur for the Digital Market Act. So one of the two key acts which we are negotiating at the moment, concentrating on exactly these issues like uh, competition, functioning, interoperability, the supervision of the competition. Andreas, what do you make of it? Well, first of all, uh, a big thanks to you, Sven, and to 
uh, your colleague uh, that have been organizing that really uh, inspiring meeting. I think uh, what Max and Shoshana have been saying is, is, is very, very helpful for our debate and very interesting. And I, I'm sure that we are all inspired, Alexandra, you and, and all the others that are here. I would like to uh, make uh, three points. The first one being that what um, Jan Philipp has mentioned, our former colleague, um, that in the area of data protection, unfortunately, we have to do with a lot of uh, national elements in the law that makes the enforcement of this law a bit more difficult. That's the difference, uh, and I have nothing done for it. It was already like that before. That is different with competition enforcement, and it's important that we really look for enforcement. I have made a change to the Commission proposal, and I hope that we can do that in the end together, because if a law in the European Parliament has to be passed, we need a strong majority in the plenary, and therefore we will need also um, um, all of your colleagues, Sven, um, and all of mine and all of the others. Um, and the point will be that in courts that you can enforce these rules on competition policy also against the gatekeepers in your member state. That can bring help to people like Max that want to go to court and have good arguments uh, to make it happen. But apart from that, still, there will be a need to have a centralized enforcement by um, authorities. And that I, I want to do at the utmost to strengthen it. But let's be honest, there are member states that they don't want to have that. They say the national authorities have to work as well. And I mean, generally speaking, there is nothing to say against national authorities if they work it out all in the exactly same spirit. But unfortunately for data protection, it hasn't worked like that. So enforcement is key. Um, and if we have good ideas, if you have good ideas, I'm very much open to, to try the utmost to make it happen. Secondly, I would like to say that I have very much liked the, the open approach of Marx and of Shoshana saying that the logic behind these companies is not that they are purely bad. I think it's a shareholder value. And uh, it's when you are working a lot in Econ, this shareholder value um, makes a huge pressure at the moment because there are no fixed costs and no um, fixed costs. I, I hope it's the right translation. And therefore, these companies, if they have invested, they just want to push uh, more um, um, infrastructure control to make the costs that are there anyhow uh, most uh, efficient. And therefore, we have to act because our market at the moment is not fair. And Max Schrems has mentioned it. These companies are not innovating anymore as they should. So mm -hmm. if we do something on this market, we even help businesses and we help consumers that more innovative products are coming back to the market. And finally, Sven, I don't want to do it too long. I'm also interested to listen to other questions. Um, it's obvious that this is not at all anti-American. I think at that point, um, the Greens, but also the EPP and, and the Americans are linked to one idea, that it means that if you have a good idea in your life and you want to make out the business of it, and you are, you, are, you are talented and you are fighting, that you should have the chance to be able to do it. Chancengleichheit, we call it in German. And with the gatekeepers at the moment, it's not what we have. Because if you have the great idea, you are coming to a bottleneck where others decide for you. And if you are not lucky, you are lost. And that cannot be our, our aim uh, in, a, in, a, in an economy in the European Union. And I think the Americans don't like that neither. So if we fight together, we can make it. And I hope that we can put strong borders to that monopolies that we have in the digital times. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, music to our ears. I saw also quite a bit of nodding from Max and Jan and Alex. Uh, and uh, one follow up, uh, which was raised here often, and this is uh, the issue of interoperability. In order to make a, a market and competition really work, uh, binding uh, open uh, interoperability seems to me crucial. So uh, what do you make of that? Uh, now you, ah, uh, uh, Andreas, so how do you see this? How binding should we be, uh, at least when it comes to the larger platforms, so that new competitors get actual access uh, to uh, the marketplace? Mark, Andreas. I mean, uh, I'm very open on this, uh, but I have to tell you that I think we should always know for what aim we want to use interoperability. The DMA, unfortunately, is not the place uh, to make rules for instant messages. It's something else. It's a competition policy file. So in the competition policy file, there is a role for authorities to make uh, the use of behavioral remedies if there is a need for interoperability. I have very much listened to what Max said on Facebook and Instagram, 
but so far this alternative um, um, interoperable tool uh, for people uh, with problems in, in, in listening and seeing or whatever is not yet uh, there. And therefore, what is the AP uh, um, uh, slot that you have to open? There I'm still uh, um, open to all proposals, but I do believe that this is not really what the DMA is about. The DMA is about breaking up monopolies and making sure that the market gets fairer by also using, in specific cases, interoperability rules. But interoperability as a principle, I think, is something maybe uh, for another law or um, um, in another context, except behavioral remedies that are needed. But I'm still listening uh, to this and looking forward for ideas that improve it. We have already had, and Alexandra was there, uh, one exchange in the committee. There was a call for that. But still, the key question is, where do we use it for what um, interoperable service that there is? Because it should not be at the end that the gatekeepers make the rules on interoperability, but those who want to use it. Yeah, Minister Jan wanted to come in. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we, we all know that there had been several tries to get interoperability done, especially in the field of um, text messaging or any other communication service, especially when it comes to the communications and telecommunications code of the European Union. Throughout the last um, three, four years, there had been several attempts and it had all been voted down, by the way, also in the European Parliament. And um, the next chance would be maybe uh, by uh, like adding some changes to those regulations when passing the e-privacy regulation. I have the feeling that um, the pressure isn't high enough to get this done at the moment. The pressure was very, very high back then when uh, telecommunication started on mobile communication at all to get that done. And uh, it, it was a great liberty which was starting afterwards by having interoperable systems so you can at least text and call each others on mobiles that you can change your contract easily. And I think that obviously the public, the public debate is not ready yet to take that also with communication services on the internet, which is a bit bizarre, but it shows how less understanding about digitization and the consequences of too less regulation in this process is in the public opinion. And I would very much hope that this debate will be taken on board a lot also during the debates on the DMA and, and other uh, issues. Max wanted to come in. And of course, always Shoshana has the right to come in with whatever she wants to put into the debate. Eh? So Max, uh, please. Just one sure, um, I'll try to be super short on, on what, what Andreas has said. I think it's totally accurate that we basically have a bit of a wild, wild west unless we have like serious enforcement. It's continue. It's gonna continue like that because the whole, that's the whole strategy. And I was taught in the US in my law school, make a risk assessment of how likely it is that there's gonna be enforcement and then make a decision to go ahead anyways. So that's simply how a lot of these decisions are made. And unless there's serious enforcement, we don't have that. Second thing, I think on this whole market thing, it's rather interesting because in, in the broader picture, we should be rather unanimous on that in the European Union from the very left to the very right, because competition is usually something everybody agrees on in, to a certain extent. Um, the, one other addition that I would have on, on this idea of innovation, I think there's a, a fundamental difference in how I was taught uh, competition in Europe and how I witnessed it in the Silicon Valley. In the Silicon Valley, we basically have a runoff phase. We have two or three competing companies where one of them just gets the biggest amount of money, <laughs> dumps everybody else off the market, and then that market is theirs full stop. So we don't have a continuous competition as we are used to it by you know, 50 people on the market that drives that innovation, that basically has this whole market um, systems run for them. We have a monopoly building competition at the beginning. So you have Lyft versus Uber. And at some point, one of them becomes so dominant that everybody else goes off the market. And I think that fundamental difference in how competition is seen is, is something that we'd have to differentiate between a European model and a Silicon Valley model. I'm explicitly saying Silicon Valley because the US model is different sometimes than the rest, than the Silicon Valley specifically. Um, last thing on the interoperability, 
um, that, for example, on messengers has been around in the end of the 90s. There were ICQ Messenger, MSN Messenger, all these different messengers that you had on your computer at the time for the older generation that I'm now counting myself to. And there were interoperable protocols like Java, for example, to enable you to write to another messaging service. It's absurd that we don't have that capacity anymore 20 years later. Like I was able to send a message from, I don't know, WhatsApp to Signal. And now 20 years later, that's for some random reason not possible. And I think that's going to be very hard to explain to the European public. If I can choose my electricity provider, my gas provider, if I can take my phone number from one provider to the next, all of these things are possible. But from one messaging service to the other, that's apparently not possible. I think that's going to be a very hard sell. And, and therefore, I think interoperability would be super interesting. Last word, I have no clue about the Digital Markets Act. I haven't read it in detail at all so far, I have to admit. Um, but what would be super interesting is that we at least have a capacity that in, in delegated implementing acts, uh, some player can say if it's the commission or whatever else, is that for this market area, you need that interoperability with that standard. So if we have that power, that could allow us to gradually say, okay, we see messaging services as a problem, there would be that protocol, every messaging service in Europe has to use that protocol full stop. And there we could gradually give that power wherever there's a bigger issue to go ahead. I can see that, you know, there may be minor, you know, apps where we may not need that from the beginning, but, but for major things, there could be that power. I'll make a, so, I'll make a comment. Oh yeah, Shoshana, please. So, you know, as you might expect, this is sort of a meta comment. <laughs> Because uh, that that so I'm I'm listening at that level, um, but you know, there's a theme that I've been hearing, and the theme is, uh, I you know, our uh, many of us agree, or I believe, or you know, many of us believe that our objective should be X, but then when we go to accomplish X through our current institutions very difficult. And there are lots of reasons why it's very difficult. And Mox is extremely eloquent. And, you know, and we've heard we've heard others um, from uh, Philip and so forth. But so so here's this, um, this, uh, this friction, this misalignment. And what I want to propose is the following, that this is exactly what we should expect right now. Because for example, you know, and forgive me for, you know, I, I have the uh, American timeline more firmly in my, in my brain than I do the German timeline, so, so forgive me on that. But if I can use the American case for a moment, you know, um, we were well into the 20th century trying to solve real problems uh, of, uh, you know, uh, the lack of a living wage, uh, you know, grossly dangerous working conditions, child labor, and so forth, you know, and, and so you, as you study the history, there's this period where there are more and more people gathering around a new set of objectives, uh, but the institutions at that point being inherited from the 19th century simply could not accommodate these goals. In America, uh, it took until the fourth decade, with the exception of a few key institutions like the federal, uh, like the Food and Drug Administration, which came on stream, I want to say 1913, after uh, about uh, 26 years of crusading. Uh, and and, and it, what flipped it was um, Sinclair, uh, Upton Sinclair's uh, book, The Jungle, of course. But the point is that with very, and even the Food and Drug Administ Administration that was first formulated in, um, in 1913, the far cry from the Food and Drug Administration that was reformulated in the fourth decade under Roosevelt, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So, and everything, I mean, the, you know, workers' rights, consumers' rights, all the institutions that we needed to oversee safe banking industry, safe equities industry, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve, um, uh, OSHA, you know, the uh, occupational health and safety, um, 
all of the social safety nets, all of these institutions came out of this paroxysm of creativity that I shudder to think in America, you know, really waited until the fourth decade. We can't wait until the fourth decade. We cannot. So what I'm hearing is the same kind of the mismatch between what we must accomplish to create a democratic information civilization and the institutional capabilities that we have current that we have currently in the bank that we've currently developed. We need to focus attention on this as a meta problem. Because part of because if the if the if the DSA or the DMA or GDPR or the new uh, legislative proposals for artificial intelligence, which, which I should have mentioned earlier because they are incredibly important in this mix. If, the, if we are going to achieve these goals, we have to figure out with our creativity, purpose-built institutional processes that will drive this. And this includes the relationships among member states, the relationships between the center and the member states, all of this needs to be uh, reimagined at a very deep level with actors like all of you who are so deeply committed, convening the right people, you know, in the room over time uh, to uh, to undertake this kind of invention. Thank you. And uh, perhaps if Jan and Andreas are still with us, I would like to share two points from the audience and uh, one from Baden-Württemberg uh, for Andreas and uh, by a well-known person, Niels Nauhauser. I will read it in German because he has spelled it out in German. Uh, he, he works uh, for the consumer protection uh, organization uh, in uh, Baden-Württemberg. Uh, das Prinzip der Einwilligung the principle of consenting to data processing under the GDPR is part of the problem, not the solution. Behavioral da data collection and data analysis, uh, in brackets, big data, shouldn't that be made illegal in principle? so that we uh, get our right to decide back. On this, but uh, I would like to open this a bit further. Uh, and the second question uh, is uh, by a German, but in English, so I will read it in English. It's by Martinas, Matthias Hoenisch, representing the German Banking um, uh, Federation of Federations, and he comes from the German cooperative banks. And it's very interesting what he's writing. In Europe, we are extremely dependent on international card schemes like MasterCard, Visa, and the like, and even more dependent from GAFA. Since payment is equivalent to information management, this is of utmost importance for data sovereignty of European customers. For those very good reasons, the cooperative banks in Germany welcome the DMA, since this act might help to bring back power to the Europeans. We truly believe that a standardized interface to GAFA infrastructures might help to bring back data to consumers and allowing European financial institutions and consumer to restore their digitalized bank cards within smartphones without paying GAFA a fortune. So, uh, anyone who wants to come in on these issues? Well, uh, well Sven Marie, I start. Um, um, I think that the point from the uh, Banking Association is, is, is right one. The GAFAs are not even sticking to PSD2 rules that are dealt with in your committee, Sven, um, because they say they are not a banking service. They are just a transaction uh, tool uh, for the data to be delivered, but for sure you pay with them and therefore uh, we have to adapt PSD2. I think that is something that we will uh, do together soon. 
On the other point, um, with the question of data, I think Shujana and, and, and also Max have, have already mentioned the element there. The key question is, who owns the data? I mean, all the questions that we have been putting into Google, is it really Google who owns these questions now? Or is it us that we have been asking these questions that we are still the owner? Now, it's true that we have given consent and uh, the, 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 the citizen from Baden-Württemberg who has kindly reminded us that this is a big problem um, has rightly made the point that we have to check that. But still, um, I think our debate tonight is more philosophical, more general than the laws that are on the table. And I, I think it was very kind from Shoshana to say that she trusts us and we have to trust a bit the commission that we get um, a, 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 an overarching um, proposal list where we can cover all the different elements because the, the, the issues with the DSA where Alexandra is working on um, is, is very much also linked with questions around the, the Trump upheaval at his uh, um, day of uh, giving up his office. Um, um, in the DMA, we speak rather really about purely competition policy to reverse it and to change the burden of proof to the gatekeepers that have very often not done something which is allowed, but it was not as clearly forbidden as needed. And that's what we want to change. And the question of IP and uh, intellectual property, how to deal with that data that are there that we need for that new system of economy, but that have to be distributed more fairly. That is, I think, a question, uh, maybe not for another evening, but, but at least for another law. Then if I may add one thing, um, I am absolutely not a friend of um, forbidding certain processing activities and uh, trying to nanny people away from giving their data. I really think that it would be the wrong path because in a liberal society, which I would like to live in, self-determination is one of the main bases on which we build our common sense. And um, the question is not to not allow me, as Max said, to like hurt myself or sell myself, but the question is to make me fully aware of all the consequences and to give me insight into what's happening. And therefore I would like to emphasize that there is one thing which the G GDPR alongside with other rules is giving us. And that is that everybody should have the right to get the logic behind automated processing to understand what processing is doing um, and to assess whether not only the process but also the purpose of that processing therefore with all its transparency is a good thing or a bad thing and in the end to either tax regulate or even for forbid certain purposes and certain business models rather than trying to forbid certain technical um, uh, patterns because, because you can use the processing of personal data and even uh, um, AI techniques which might be used in a very bad way also in a very good way. And um, I therefore would really warn from getting away of the um, a concept of consent because it's the basis of our self-determination. And I would even say that you can't get away from it without changing the European treaties. Yes. So, um we are finally going to conclusion. There's one uh, question by Jana um, Reimer, I think, or similar. Yeah, uh, and uh, and that is uh, to Shoshana, uh, and uh, and that is uh, today citizens feel benefits by Facebook, Google, and Amazon, and only go to court in individual cases. How do we raise awareness among citizens that they should be just as active as those forming unions during industrialization? So basically, how do we get citizens to all join a Max organization uh, and others? So uh, small uh, 
small hint to the audience. Uh, but Shoshana, on a more general term, uh, how do you see that? Well, there is no question <clears throat> that um, public opinion, public education, public opinion, and ultimately uh, collective action coming from the public in, in a whole variety of new forms uh, is essential to this, uh, this uh, counter, uh, the democratic counter-revolution as I, as I put it today. Um, and in fact, that was, that was a question that I, I wanted to, um, you know, to, to mention in relation to um, Marx's concerns just, you know, what is the role right now that the public is playing or can play or should play? Now, when it, when it comes to, um, to the, well, the specific question asked by our, by our participant, um, we're, we're operating in, in this milieu right now, which, which has had the benefit of uh, two decades of intense propaganda work. Uh, think of it as gaslighting, intense gaslighting of the public uh, that has been uh, engineered and scripted, uh, practiced through trial and error, perfected uh, on, the, on the part of the, of the tech giants. And so there is a lot of confusion <laughs> and a lot of disorientation uh, people over the past few years, you know, haven't been certain. One issue is exactly what uh, Philip was asking, which is um, it's not whether or not I choose to share data, it's whether or not I have any clue of what's happening to those data were I to share. Do you have any clue that your family photos on Facebook have been scraped into Microsoft's um, uh, celebrity facial recognition software, uh, the, the best facial recognition software in the wild, and ultimately was sold to military divisions of the Chinese army that imprison the, the Uyghurs in open air spaces where they are continuously monitored by facial recognition, in part built by our family photos, right? That is one of thousands of examples where we've been we have been told that we're making a private calculation to give a little bit of data for a good trade-off, we get these free services, when in fact, go back to something I said earlier, those trillions of data points being ingested every day by Facebook's AI, um, only a fraction of them are what we knowingly gave Facebook. The rest is what has been captured through, dare I say it, surveillance. So, um, so, so we, we have a, a public that has been disadvantaged intentionally, that has been engineered into ignorance intentionally. And therefore, um, we have a, a lot of work in public education. Now, having said this, there is, in my view, an unquestionable sea change in the public mind. Um, let me start with America. Uh, by by um, August of 2020, well into the pandemic, remember we went into the pandemic with the tech companies saying, this will be the end of tech lash. Everyone's gonna depend on us, Zoom, everybody's gonna love us uh, because we're enabling their lives, their children's education and so on and so forth. Well, early on reporters were calling me about that. I said, just the opposite is gonna happen. We're all gonna feel angry. We're all going to feel the indignity of this dependency and its, its operations. Well, of course, by the end of August, two uh, very substantial national surveys in America, which has been the laggard in this subject, showed unbelievable majorities in the 70th, 80th, and 90th percentiles across the board, a complete rupture of faith with these companies. Uh, they're creating more problems than they're solving. Uh, they're putting their profits above a society and democracy. We don't trust them. The only entity that garners less trust than Mark Zuckerberg is the tobacco industry and on and on and on. So um, that's an indication of real change. 
and what's 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 really you know what's what's really kind of blocking this is that you feel indignant you feel angry you fill out the survey this way what do you do where do you go there's no 911 to call there's no information line to call at google or or facebook or any of the others so what do you do so this again is part of this institutional discussion we need to build the channels that move from all the people I know and my little community here are, are, really, are really fed up with all of this. They wanna know what to do. So between the uh, democratic institutions uh, and the lawmakers, lawmakers need these citizens. They need these fed up citizens. They, they need these indignant citizens. How do we build the channels that connect the lawmakers and the citizens? Because lawmakers are going to go further, faster. Uh, the things that we've been talking about are not pipe dreams. If the citizens are at the back of the lawmakers, uh, Im imposing pressure at every move, uh, and, the, and the citizens move from being merely indignant to actually being constructive. And that, that is what happened in the 20th century. Uh, in, in my country that was so much a part of the push toward institution building. So um, this is something that, um, I th you know, I think that needs attention in your larger program of, uh, of finalizing this first foundational uh, uh, era of, of new legislation. And um, uh, you know, not as something that will just be emergent and, and will be opportunistic, but as something that we intentionally build into our societies, which is why I brought up the, um, you know, the right of private action, because as, as Marx has done, he has used that right of private action to create an institution, none of your business, and that institution gathers plaintiffs to it. It gathers indignant citizens to it and it becomes a hub of creative action. So um, critical, critical subject. And there's a lot that we, that is happening and a lot we can do. Thank you so much. Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Shoshana Zuboff. This was very impressive, very difficult to add important words to you after, after listening to you. This is really a challenge. Um, I think what is really important is to understand that this is not about digital technology. This is about the civilization, the society which we want to live in. And this is why this topic regards everybody and not only people interested in the technology. It regards even more maybe those who are not interested in the technology, but interested in living in a free and democratic society. And I think the good news we can take away from tonight is that you said it in the beginning, Europe is the frontier. And the world is looking at Europe for leadership. And I think this is very impressive because in Europe, especially those um, who work on technology always have the feeling or always told we are being left behind, behind the US and behind China and we have to catch up. And then look, maybe we don't have to catch up because we, we are going in a different direction and we will be the leaders in that direction. So I think this is, this is a really encouraging <laughs> narrative. And um, I also very much like the idea of being a young information civilization, so we can still decide who we want to be. And it's very important what Max Schrems said also in the, in, the, in the beginning, let's break up the narrative of inevitability. Um, this is really what in the Brussels bubble, everybody is telling you, the companies are telling you and even my colleagues, well, I mean, what do you want to do about it? It's, it's like that anyway. And any suggestion to live in a really free and democratic society to have real data protection, real privacy is considered radical. But it's not. It's our constitution. Those are our European Charter of Fundamental Rights. Those are our values. And the same way we defend them when we speak about rule of law, or maybe in some other European member states, 
we should have rule of law in all 27 member states as far as democracy and data protection are concerned. So the Titanic is moving towards the iceberg, but I'm sure that in Europe, we have the force to divert it, to avoid the iceberg and to go into open sea, into a better kind of sea. And what, what is really important and what we're actually working on day and night in these days is um, the enforcement structure. We need a legis legislation that we can really enforce. And here, I hope we will get a strong consensus at least in the European Parliament and in the European Council to come up with that. Another focus of, of my work is, and I was happy that you mentioned that Professor Zuboff, um, the harms affect real normal citizens and they have no way and they have no redress. And this is something we can set right within the DSA with good notice and action with real redress. But we're also building in um, elements of really democratic civic participation with citizens assemblies and social media council and so on because I think we have this equation of governments and authorities on the one hand and big corporations on the other one and where the citizens and I think the citizens really have should have their say here and we have the chance in the DSA to do that. Um, I think a very open question where I saw a little bit of disagreement between you Shoshana on the one hand and Marx and Jan Philip on the other hand, and I think this is a really important issue, is how can we use consent as an instrument in a world where people don't have an understanding of what really happens with their data. So I would like to, to stick to the idea of consent, but I think right now people are, don't know and don't really have the possibility to know what they're consenting to exactly. So how to solve that equation, that's not clear to me yet. I think we need a lot more information and I'm very happy we have a great speaker like you informing us about what is really happening with our data, what is the hidden layer behind it and how can we use consent in that kind of, of situation? How shall we shape the instruments in order for people to understand? I read last week in an official document of the UK government that Google holds three, the equivalent in terms of data of 3 million pages of a Word document about every single user, 3 million pages of a Word document. You know, if you write that in a cookie banner, I'm not sure how many people will, will, will still agree. And, and also the example you made on the Ugos and our facial recognition, our family pictures used for, for persecuting a population. But how do you put that on a consent form? This, this is still a little bit of a dilemma I'm, I'm battling with and I hope for, for help in the future. But what is important is this is not inevitable. We can change this. We can create a better society. And I think, and we need a lot of things. We need new legislation. We need better enforcement of the existing legislation. That means litigation. We need people's activism in order to push politicians to create public pressure. And in Europe, we need to do it on a European level. This is not a challenge that any member state can face on its own, but it's, it's our common task it's our common challenge, and I'm sure we will be able to master it on a European level, obviously always in a, in a very close dialogue with the US and transatlantic dialogue. And I'm very happy that there's so many things going on in the US. The US are looking at us and we are looking at the US and we have this really, we're having this really fruitful dialogue at, at many different uh, levels. And that's important. I think that the Western world stands united here, but if we can manage to be at the forefront here in Europe, personally, as a European, I would be very proud of that. So I count on the help of all of you because we will need all of you in, in the big legislation projects we have ahead of us in Europe. And I would like to thank you all for being here tonight. First of all, I would like to thank the interpreters who had a different, difficult task uh, tonight in this, on this difficult topic. So thank you very much for your work for making this, this plurilingual dialogue possible. I would like to thank all the participants for the intelligent and smart questions. I'm, I'm sorry, we obviously couldn't take all of them with more than a thousand people on the call in the beginning and, and 150 um, questions. We, we had to make a choice and I think it was a, a choice very well made. Um, I would like to thank um, Jan Philipp Albrecht for being with us, Andreas Schwab for being with us, and especially, I would like to thank Max Schrems and Professor Shoshana Zuboff 
for their extremely important and visionary words. I hope you will accompany us further. And I would also like to thank Sven and my team who organized this, which was a lot of work. Thank you so much for your professionality. <clears throat> that, was, that was absolutely great. And to all of you who are still with us at this late hour after two and a half hours, um, follow us on social media. And I realize this is a perfect contradiction, but we are dealing with monopolies here. And as politicians, in order to be able to communicate to a crowd, we have to go on Zoom. I'm sorry. And we have to communicate on social media, because if we want to have a critical mass to stop the surveillance, and to create a better society with digital technologies, we need this critical mass and we need to reach people. And this is unfortunately where you reach people. I hope we will change this, this soon. We do our best, but right now you get our news on social media and sign up to our newsletters. We keep you informed on what is going on in Europe. Thank you all very much for this insightful and inspiring evening. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. It's been such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. An honor. My pleasure. <laughs> An hour honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.